in their veins. Mackie and Judd on Score North and scorenorth.com. For someone to step in in that situation and ultimately make a decision that that was blocking the plate, that's beyond embarrassing for our game, for all the players out there on both sides of the field working their ass off for the entire game. It's completely unacceptable. I can't even believe I'm sitting here talking to you guys about this right now. It's one of the worst moments I think we've seen of umpiring in any game I've ever been a part of in baseball. And I think it was pathetic. Oh, my God. Inject that version of Rocco into my veins. Go on, sir. Please. Oh, God, it was great. Dude, I could have listened to him for three hours, light those umpires up, and light, is it New York? Where do they do the replays? New York? New York, yes, yes. Yep, and they, they do it now with, so they, they have two umpires who are on cruise but are sent to the replay center for, I don't know, days or week or something, and, and it, it was Jordan Baker. Jordan Baker made this call. I wasn't really surprised. And Rocco, Rocco, on his way out after getting ejected, rightfully so, the most mm-hmm. warranted ejection in the history of Rocco's managerial career. Oh, he yeah. did flip a bird. Was it a bird? Did he flip the bird? He definitely he definitely yelled "f off" without censoring himself to sort of two areas of the press box, yes. not at the reporters. I think it was his way of trying to say yeah. like, "Hey, whoever's up there making right. this decision, yes. even though you're in New York." F off, F off, I and then he it. walked back into the I dugout. loved that meltdown. It was absolutely spot on, and it was great. It's very rare that we actually start the Monday Statements edition of the show with the buffoon of the week, but I think it, I think it's warranted here to start the show with this. Okay, I am going to read to you guys a summation of the blocking the plate rule in Major League Baseball here. And all I want, I'm going to read this, and all I want you guys to do And you guys are huge baseball fans, diehards. You're not casual baseball fans. We got a season, noted season ticket holder, Declan Goff here. Okay. Judd spends more time in the twins press box than he does with his wife. So these are these aren't casual baseball fans. And she likes that, just to be very clear. (laughs) (laughs) And she signs off. She actually requests that that happens. She's requesting your press credential for you. (laughs) I was told I applied I applied for spring training credentials. I was told Saturday she said, I said, Do you mind if I go? And she says, I want you to go. Please get out of here. Please leave right now. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm gonna read this to you. All I want you to do is once I read this, decipher the blocking the plate rule. In plain English, okay? Sure. Tell tell me in one sentence or two sentences, to the best of your ability, what can and can't you do? So this is... The, actually, you know what? Before I even read this, tell me to the best of yeah. your ability, before I even read this, what can and can't you do? You can't... So the catcher, unless he has the ball in his possession, cannot block the base path. He needs to create a clear lane for the runner. And the runner needs to do his best to avoid the catcher as to not create a collision. So if you if you don't have the ball yet, if the center fielder is is scooping up the ball and there's a runner bearing barreling down from third to home. I have to be in front you, of the plate. You, yeah, you can't be standing in front of the plate. I can't straddle the plate. Okay. Yeah. And if you're the runner, so if the so you you can't just barrel in like when can you barrel into the catcher? You can't, right? You can't. You just can't, you can't. There's, under no circumstance can you barrel it, into the catcher. It's basically a must slide rule. Okay, I think that's it. Yeah, that's right. Which fair. has been which has been in like Legion baseball for thirty five mm-hmm. years. Yes, forever. So here's a summation from the Athletic. The second comment. This is from like I don't know, a few years ago when they're recapping the the rule change from 2011 is the first time this came into the public consciousness when uh, Buster Posey got yep. shredded on a collision at home plate, and then the rule came into effect like three years later. But Mm-hmm. Unless the catcher is in possession of the ball, the catcher cannot block the pathway of the runner as he is attempting to score. The runner shall be declared safe if the catcher violates that provision. So, again, if you don't have the ball, you can't stand in front of the plate. It makes total sense. Get off the tracks when the train's coming through. In addition, it is not a violation if the catcher blocks the – so it is not a violation if the catcher blocks the pathway of the runner in order to field a throw – and the umpire determines that the catcher could not have fielded the ball without blocking the pathway uh, and that the contact with the runner was unavoidable. What if you get the ball and the runner is still like, you know, halfway down the third baseline? Can you move into the line then? Or mm-hmm. do you like, so, so now I have the ball. 
You can move in. And he is 40 feet away from me. Now I can move in front and he's just screwed, right? And you can just tag him. Yes. Okay. So I've watched that play 25 times yesterday. Great mm-hmm. throw. Gary Sanchez, before the throw is there, and it was an amazing throw from Tim Beckham in left field. My God. Uh, Buxton also had an amazing throw to third base. They almost they almost got him twice. So mm-hmm. Sanchez catches Sanchez is standing in front of the plate as the ball is arriving. The ball is kind of coming in to his left a little bit because it's coming in from the left fielder. And so it's a right-handed thrower from left field. The ball is tailing to the right or to the left of Gary Sanchez toward the third baseline. He catches the ball all in one motion and puts his knee on the ground. So now he has the ball and he's sliding in front of home plate because he has the ball. And the runner has not officially arrived yet. How in the world? I'm with Rocco. How do you reverse the call? I can see on the fly if you said, ooh, bang, bang. Ooh, I thought that was catcher's interference. Now it's 50-50. It's tough to overturn. How do you overturn that? And why is it even a rule? Like, at this point, just right. go back to the old thing. And if a catcher gets lit up once every three years, whatever. Just stand in front of the plate if you want to stand in front of the plate and keep yourself safe. When this rule was passed in uh, 2014, and, and it was solely passed because Buster Posey was really good and got hurt. And they're like, we want our good players, if they're a catcher, not to get hurt. Um, but Then don't then, then Buster Posey, don't stand in front of the plate. It's, then you get or to just choose. move to first base, dude. Um, yeah. But... In t- from 2014 on, I said this is a stupid rule because we need to protect athletes from things that they don't need to be subjected to. For instance, in baseball, I'm mad. I'm mad because the last guy hit a home run, so I'm going to throw a 96-mile-per-hour fastball at the next guy's head. I'm an idiot. Like, that. what's that doing? That's not helping the game, and God forbid the guy gets hit by it in the head. you got real problems, Okay. This rule, first of all, collisions at the plate are rare. They're not like commonplace. They're, it's not, we don't see them. It's not, it's, when we're talking about CTE, okay, foul tips that hit catchers' helmets are a much bigger problem. That's repetitive. Yeah. Collisions at the plate aren't. Um, the other thing is, this is professional sports. And the most important thing in the game of baseball is to score runs. Um. This could happen in a World Series game. This could happen in a playoff game. Dude. And so I can't have two adults, you know, because to just be extremely clear, amateur baseball, this is great. Must slide is very smart. We don't need collisions there. But when you're paid millions of dollars to play a sport and it is your livelihood and your livelihood revolves around touching home plate, okay? You're telling me we need to be splitting hairs on this stupid of rule? On, on, on a rule that clearly, clearly is subjective and nobody understands. Why does this rule exist? And I got pushback on Twitter of, well, do you want people getting hurt to score a run? Yeah. If it needs to happen. Okay. Yes, I do. There's, there's two, there's, yes. So there's, there's two things to unpack here. There's the rule, which mm-hmm. let's put that aside for a second. Like the, whether the rule should be in place or not. Mm-hmm. The rule is in place. The rule was not violated yesterday. Let's start there. The rule was not violated yesterday. Mm -hmm. Again, here's the rule. Unless the catcher is in possession of the ball, the catcher cannot block the pathway of the runner. So if you don't have the ball, you can't block the pathway. Mm -hmm. When the ball was in the air, Gary Sanchez was in front of the plate. As the ball was coming to him, again, coming in toward his left, taking him sort of into the baseline, the, the ball was coming in right down the baseline or just along, so he's got to catch the ball. So you can argue two different ways that he was in the right. Number one, oh, the ball is sort of taking me in this direction, and I have a right to catch the ball, so I'm clear there. But even if you don't think I'm clear there, now I have caught the ball, and as I'm catching the ball, I'm now sliding in front of the home plate with my knee, which is legal, as the runner's coming in. So unless I'm just being a homer... I saw that play twice, and according to the ridiculous rule, he was in the clear twice, which is why Rocco showed more emotion than he showed in four years here, right? But on the rule itself, what if you just said, okay, this is so ridiculous and confusing, and let me back up a step even further. If you showed that play to a casual baseball fan and said, hey, watch this cool play that just happened, and before we even show you what the what the replay booth in New York showed you, okay, so here's a runner coming home, and a ball is thrown to home plate, and the catcher catches it, what are your thoughts? And I think the person watching would say, wow, that's a perfect throw. Oh, man, look at the good job the catcher did of catching the ball, putting his leg down. Yeah, that guy's out. 
At no point would anyone say, well, wait a second, that didn't look fair. I don't know that that catcher should have been sliding into position where he was. It reminds me of the like the Des Bryant catch thing from 10 years ago. Okay, he catches the football, right. one foot, two foot, lunge, ball out, right? He's like full control of the ball, ball out. Right. If you didn't know the rule, nobody in America would have questioned, boy, I don't know if that was a catch. But then when you start to look at the letter of the law and over dissecting it, you start to talk yourself and think yourself into a circle. Right. That's not what the rule should the, the, the rule should not make you have to do five different jumps through hoops to figure out how to turn a play that was very common for a hundred years in baseball into an out. And, so stupid. And where where what transpired on Sunday serves as why the rule should be taken out, just ditched completely. Merrifield admitted post game he purposely slid like he did because he could have gone. He could have tried to go in the backside and and yeah. and slapped his left hand off home plate. And by the way, I think he's safe then because because mm -hmm. then. Sanchez is sweeping backwards, mm -hmm. but he said, I purposely slid like that because I knew that that was going to bring that rule into question if I was out. Think about that for a second. So, so, and that's brilliant. That's smart. But again, if you're smart enough, if you are smart enough to say, I'm going to exploit a stupid rule that, that should not be in place in a professional sport and make no mistake, this should not be in place. This is akin to basically saying in football, a linebacker can't tackle a running back mm -hmm. too hard. Like, like you can't, you're legislating part of the game out. I agree with legislating things helmet to helmet, right? That's dangerous. We know what that is. But you never say, well, you can't tackle now. This is saying you can't tackle. This is saying um, I would much rather prefer that that play should have been this. And this is going to sound harsh, but it should have been. Merrifield should have had the right to try to blow up Sanchez off the plate because it's a bang bang play, and if you and if you go into him, he's going to lose that ball, mm -hmm. and it's a collision, and I'm fine with that. So I th I think if you could boil the rule that what the rule is supposed to it, 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 the first part of the rule I'm guessing as they were negotiating it was we can't have runners charging into catchers. Right. So the so the 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 conversation was sort of flipped around the opposite, which is yep. stop trucking catchers. The new rule is going to be. You can you have to slide or or run through the plate, you, but you cannot run through the catcher or or tackle the catcher. Yep. But then somebody on the other side, rightfully so, said, "Well, wait a second here. What if a catcher is just standing in front of home plate? Mm -hmm. What am I supposed to do?" And then they said, "Okay, that's a good point. I guess if he if he has the ball, then you're just sort of out. You're just kind of screwed. Yep. But if he doesn't have the ball, then it's a violation on the catcher." Mm -hmm. But last night or yesterday, Gary Sanchez had the ball when he moved in front of home plate. Right. What is he supposed to do? Catch the ball and like move out of the way as Merrifield's coming in? So what what if we just went back and said, here's the new rule. You can't barrel into catchers. There is no other part to this. If the catcher wants to lay down in front of home plate, sorry, jump over him or figure it out some other way. Like that like if you to me that would simplify it even more than yesterday's fiasco. No. Dex, go ahead. Well, I mean, I, I don't really understand it. it. And it's just a crappy way to end a baseball game. Um, and I understand you're trying to protect the catcher's safety. I, I get that. But at the end of the day, like, that's how we're going to win and lose a baseball game. Like, even if you're Toronto, like, do you feel good about that? And I, I saw some Blue Jays fans were, you know, just stirring it up. And, like, that's fandom. Like, there's going to be some some idiots on the other side who just are going are gonna to say things and get the other fan base riled up. But I think it's a crap way to end a baseball game. And it just, I don't know, it feels like classic baseball. Just like, really? This is this is how we're going to end the game? This this, this ob obscure, obscure rule that Phil's talking about, like as a casual fan, if someone turned the Twins game on, who maybe likes to watch a baseball game here and there, is going to watch that play and be like, what? What do you mean that is, that's how this game ends and that's catcher's interference? It's Correct. subjective and it's just BS. That's basically what it boils down to. Yep, dude, it's the catch rule in, in football. It's like yeah. okay, now we've we've made it so complicated. Yes. yes, it's the catch rule in football, and and it's the same thing. And Dex and I see this continually: goalie interference in hockey. No one oh, can yeah. define it. Yeah, Zero no can. people can define. And if you can't define it, you've got to rework it. But in this case, what I'm saying is, I agree with making rules to protect people that don't involve that involve unnecessary things. Throwing at batters, unnecessary. Like. 
pitching inside is fine. But if a ball comes at a guy's head on purpose, that's a major problem, right? There are things that you can do to protect human beings, and that's fine. But there comes a point in time, too, where, where if an adult chooses to play a sport and gets paid very well to do so, right? I want the best competition possible. And yesterday, I want Merrifield to have the right to jar that ball loose. And I don't, what's the, okay, Gary Sanchez gets hurt. Well, that's too bad, but that's a risk of sports. Like you you are literally taking out, you are trying to treat these guys like they are young, you know, I got a tweet about that. What about the young men? First of all, they ain't all young. Second of all, I am not, at some point in time, we have to put the the concern about injury aside. Pitching in, pitching in and of itself is clearly dangerous. Guys are blowing out their arms continually, right? But we don't say, well, what, and, and this is and this is very close. If we said, we have decided in Major League Baseball to go to a innings or pitch limit because we're going to try and protect arms. I'm going to call BS. This is professional sports. You're choosing to do this, which is great. I love it. Yeah. But th- but my problem is, wh- why are we? Go- why does this rule exist? Because one guy got got hurt. And at some point in time, you have to assume risk. Like, are we next going to say, new rule, Byron Buxton, if you crash into a fence, you're ejected. <laughs> or or, or protect, trust us. We're, we're, we're protecting, protecting you, you from yourself. Yeah. I'm serious. Like, I, pre- this has been my argument from the, day one. The, fen- the fence is ejected. We're removing yeah. the fence. If <laughs> No, it's got like a shock thing. If yeah, you go the into the fence, color. you're going to be severely shocked and probably hurt worse than you will be by the collision, but you'll never go into that fence again. Anyway. We'll, we'll get to twin statements here and also Viking statements on a Statements Monday, but we had to start off with Buffoon of the Week, and it is, I guess I didn't even say who it was. The Buffoon of the Week is Major League Baseball and their ridiculous uh, blocking the plate rule that was incorrectly enforced, by the way, in that game yesterday. A shout-out to our friends real quick at Equity Partners. So Equity Partners believes the house-selling process should be 100% hassle-free unlike some of these dumb rules in Major League Baseball. All right, it's all about providing simplicity and value for you, the homeowner. From simple fixes to remodels, when you partner with uh, with uh, equity partners, they will help fix up your home before you put it on the market. And then, and this might be the best benefit, you can move before you sell. You can put offers in on your next home, non-contingent on the sale of yours while getting great value with the fix-ups for your current home. Learn more at equitypartnersmn.com or call 612 612- 999-2244. 612-999-2244. All right. Also, it's lake season, Dex. And it is. Uh, actually, our guy, we had Chris Jericho on a bonus episode of uh, Mackie and Judd today. You can find that at some point here on this Monday on the Mackie and Judd podcast. We talked about his wife's from Hibbing, likes to yep. go up to the lakes up north of Minnesota. So if Chris Jericho has murky lakeside areas, mm-hmm. we got a recommendation for him. Yeah, how about Aquaside, Chris? How about uh, how about you get some a uh, little bit of the bubbly and a little bit of the Aquaside, and then you don't don't mix them together, but enjoy the bubbly on the dock while you jump into that lake. That's an Aquaside lake that can help you remove that nasty lake weed and algae with the Aquaside pellets, which by the way are safe. They're registered with the EPA and the DNR, so they're not just some wonky pellets you're throwing into the lake that hurt the wildlife or hurt the fish in there. No, they're safe products that are both registered with the EPA and the DNR. You can stop in the metro at White Bear Lake to go see them, or you can order online. At Aquaside.com. Aquaside pellets. Aquaside.com to learn more. All right, Judd, lead us off here. Statements Monday. All right. All right. My first statement is this. There we go. There we go. All right. 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 Awesome. Right right. Right music. TNT, little hockey theme song. Yes. You done good. Off of the controversy that, that we just discussed, which is a rule that's terrible and by the way very much could have taught have cost the twins because uh they are now going into monday's action and they're off monday thursday this week only a game up on cleveland and i think two up on the white Sox. you done good rocco uh i want to talk about what rocco did not in the vacuum of one game um i feel like rocco and look this might be i'm sure that there are some who are going to, to say judd you're not serious here but i am um, sports has an emotional, emotional tie to it. There's no question about that. And I think players can be galvanized by things. And I think what Rocco did in going absolutely ballistic and then providing a presser in which he dropped, uh, F bombs, like, like this was not normal. This was him. This was, this was him. We finally saw him. It was great. Um, but I think that this is going to galvanize and become a rallying cry. 
I think that this might be Rocco's 2019 Aaron Boone, my guys are effing savages. My guys are effing savages, yeah. and you're costing us right now. I think this might be it. I don't know what the T-shirt is here, boys, but... <laughs> it worked but, out really well for the Yankees that year. But, uh, well, I mean, they beat the Twins in the first round in three games. But anyway, the point <laughs> is, I think that this is going to help the Twins. I think it's going to be a rallying cry. And, and as stupid as this might seem, Phil, you, you've uh, seen this too. It doesn't take a lot to create a very, uh, very cohesive us against them mentality. Like, that's what players want. They're looking for that, right? And Rocco's got that now. So I actually believe long run, this whole thing, as as tough of a way as it was to lose that game, might benefit the Twins and Rocco. And I think that Rocco gained immeasurable respect in that clubhouse yesterday through his actions. I would even say, I, I'm in lockstep with Judd, too, because my, my first statement was, bravo, Rocco. Um, and to Judd's point, I, I agree. I think this is kind of a turning point of the perception of him. Like, and I don't believe it was just yesterday's catcher's interference rule in this pie chart, if you will, of Rocco turning the table. I, I think it, like it's this. pent up frustration of That's losing right. a lot last year. It's pent up frustration of the front office waiting at the last the possible minute to get arms pie. at the deadline. Um, this is this is in the this whole stew of everything. Like it really is. R- Rocco, we we've criticized him for being a puppet. We play an Elmo sounder after him because Rocco is not just a rock. Like we we've, we've criticized him sometimes before. I think he's only been ejected seven times right in three years as a manager. Like the dude, he's very cool, cool, calm, collected. Hey, come in when you want. Take a nap when you want. Here's some robes. Here's like this laid back attitude. And you know what? With some people in in the younger generation, my age and even younger. That, that's needed. There's some coddling that happens for better or worse. But yesterday, I think that was a accumulation of everything that has been going wrong with the Twins. And he's pissed off. He's barely holding on to this division lead. The umpire gives the Blue Jays a game. I think yesterday was a turning point in the perception of Rocco Baldelli as the Twins manager. Yeah, I... Uh... I, I like it. This is I, I like seeing a less suppressed version of him. And listen, we had bones to pick with Garden Hire throughout the years too, and the way that he went about just tactical things and bullpen and lineup construction. And so I, I don't want to sit here and say, yeah, just because you show Guardy level emotion means that right. now the team's going to perform. You know, there's there's more. I, I think baseball is is probably the least served in terms of uh, the success you can have as a team. It's the least served by emotion. It's, if you get over emotional, it can cause you to swing and miss at pitches that you wouldn't otherwise offer at. So I don't, I don't want them to now be playing with a bunch of emotion that they weren't playing with before. It's got to be controlled. But yeah, maybe there is a little, a little uh, us against the world mentality they can sort of tap into after this. I think the difference is this though, with Guardy, it it was like, well, there he goes again, right? And that was it. With Rocco, we had never. I mean, Mount Rocco erupted. Yeah, yeah. that's great. That volcano had been dormant for forty years. I'm glad, I, and I also had I, I had good for Rocco as one of my statements. We're all kind of in the same boat here. I remember, I, I mean, I tweeted out, it, I, I tweeted two things. One, if this gets overturned, just light Major League Baseball on fire <laughs> forever. Tweet. And then my next tweet was, if this gets overturned, Rocco needs to get ejected. And within three, he got ejected within three seconds. He said something on the top step of the dugout as he was walking out. I'm also pretty sure if you go back and watch. I think one of his assistants, Rocco must have said something to one of his assistants, like, if this gets overturned, I am going to lose my mind. Because I'm pretty sure once it got overturned, one of his assistants patted him on the back like, here we go. <laughs> he probably did. And it was then probably Tingler or something, up. right? But the, the F off, F I'm off. Bleep you. I think it was bleep the, you, bleep off. It I was, think I th- It wasn't. It was, it was bleep off, bleep off. People had it wrong in the... It was bleep off. I had it wrong, too. I thought it was bleep you, bleep off. But it was bleep off, bleep off, roll the tape. We can't on this show. But I guess technically it's you know, we can hear him saying it, so I guess we could roll the tape. But. I'm sure John Boy is going to break it down. All oh, yeah. a, a beautiful five-minute breakdown of, of everything that's happening. I can't wait yes. to see that, too. Uh, I'll give you another one here. I, I want Twins Jays in October. I have that, too. It would yes. be a blast. This yes. the, the, the lineups, the personalities... Jose, the Jose Barrios factor, twin, you know, the twins stuck it to him over the weekend. Uh, the the Jays are good, man. That is a legitimate team, and a five-run lead is not safe against that lineup. But it kind of felt like the twins, 
if, if that call goes the right way at home plate, it's not a guaranteed Twins win because they still have to score, but kind of felt like the Twins got the better of the Jays in this series, and I, I'd love to see those teams in a three-game series, ideally at Target Field. Yeah, and the fan, the fans who came from Canada were phenomenal. Oh, it was great. that That was four days of playoff baseball. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Like the back and forth between the fans, it was absolutely fantastic. And yeah, the Jays are really good. Um, but actually, that leads to my next statement, and that is: this is how we bullpen. This is how we bullpen. In the wins on Friday and Saturday, we started to see a preview of what we want. And it's not always perfection, but we're not expecting perfection. We're expecting competence, right? On fr- on uh, Friday, Malley goes um, six and gives up four runs. It then goes Jax Duran Lopez, who blows the save. Fulmer, they win. And, and across uh, the final four innings of baseball, those four gave up one run. On Saturday, Bundy gives up two and four. Then we go McGill, Fulmer, Theobar, Jax, Duran, Lopez, they give up one run in the final five. Most importantly, on back-to-back days, we got Fulmer, we got Lopez, we got Duran, and Jax. Um, It might not always be perfection, but you know what? If you are willing to, and it certainly looks like we're trending here, if you are willing to throw those guys on back-to-back days, I start to trust the process a lot more. Yeah, and Rocco. Yeah, Rocco did say he's you know open open to doing it more down the stretch. But I think yesterday even was because you're going to have games like yesterday where and this dude this might happen in a three game wild card series because you do not get an off day. So you like yesterday you're faced with okay, do we throw these guys some of these guys a third day in a row? Probably not in the early part of August. Right. Or do we have to roll with Cole Sands for two and a third? And he did very well yesterday. But all of it yesterday, I know they lost the game. All of it stemmed from Chris Archer giving you five solid innings. He has very quietly, I'm not saying he's the MVP of the pitching staff, but he has very quietly been a successful scrap heap signing for them. And he's he's never gone more than five. It's always four or five innings for him, and there's going to be some starts where he gives up like five walks, but he's. I feel like he's dialed it in more as the year has gone on, and if he can just give you five innings, four and two-thirds or five innings, and you, and you can kind of prepare for it two days in advance, he's not going to give you seven, mm-hmm. that's fine. Um... That was exactly what you needed from Chris Archer yesterday to give yourself a chance late in the game. Because if he went two innings, you were screwed yesterday without basically your three best relievers. So, anyway. Look at Judd and I almost in lockstep with uh, with our statements here. Off My second one was, too, I love the twin chances to win a playoff game here. I still love the twin chances, even though they split two against Toronto. I know they melted down with their bullpen usage a little bit, but look... To Judd's point, you're not you're not going to be batting a thousand with that percentage. But do I feel a hell of a lot better with Lopez and Duran in the eighth and ninth, and guys like Michael Fulmer who can come in in a pinch situation who have been there, done that? Yes, I do. The Twins' chances of winning a playoff game, I think, are still legitimate. They went out on the trade deadline. They bolstered their bullpen. They don't have their starters go through five to six innings, and they gave every, they give themselves every chance they can with. Three legitimate bullets now in their bullpen. And look, Toronto's legit, man. To your guys' point, they might see this team in the playoffs. If the Twins win their division, they will be able to host the, the first round of the series. So no matter what happens there, even if Toronto has a better record than them, the Twins still do get the division at home. So that's good news. But the Twins' chances to win a playoff game are still pretty good. And I know in Minnesota sports, that's a low bar here. But they haven't won a playoff game in 18 consecutive tries. The Oakland A's swept the Astros like two weeks ago. You're telling me there's not one instance where the Twins can just win a GD playoff game. That's all I care about. Win the playoff game, and I like their chance to do so. Uh, My next twin statement is, finally, some common sense against the shift. If you noticed early in that game against Kevin Gausman, who the, the Twins did not get the best of this time around like they did the first time around, Jorge Polanco, batting, I believe, left-handed, did kind of a check swing bunt thing to the open hole where Matt Chapman would have been standing. And he gets aboard on first base, standing ovation from the from the crowd. I don't understand why more hitters don't do that. He didn't take a full... It, no one was asking him to take a full swing against that stuff and try and do a full swing, but if you see a gap, especially if you're a, if you're if the gap is on the third base side like that, 
just take a little check swing, left-handed hitter, check swing, poke a ball in the left field. It was very intentional. So bravo to Jorge Polanco for showing some common sense against the shift. Absolutely. Big fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, any other twin statements from you guys? Yeah, I've got one, uh, and it, it's this. The hidden problem of the weekend. So so how do you avoid what transpired at home plate yesterday? It's very simple. In this series, which, by the way, they split, and at times I thought played well. The Twins, with runners in scoring position, were 8 for 44. Mm, that's awful. 8 for 44, including Friday when they won, 3 of 15. Saturday when they won, 3 of 16. Yesterday, 2 of 10. You get a couple more hits. Yesterday, guess what? It probably doesn't come down to that play at the plate. The point is, the point is for all we talk about the bullpen and pitching, and that certainly is important. Eight for 44 with runners in scoring position is not going to cut it for a serious playoff team. Yeah. I got one more here. One more twin. Here. Pour one out for Tyler Duffy. <laughs> nice little three year run. He was legitimately one of the better setup guys in baseball between 2019 and 2021. He's yep. still only 31 years old, and so I, I could see him. Sometimes yeah. you just have weird years as a reliever. I, I could definitely see him. He'll latch on somewhere, I'm sure, and uh, I could see him being a, a good late-inning guy again. Now, he's made about $10 million in his life playing baseball so far. It was a good run. I think his Twins career is now bookended by the Toronto Blue Jays lineup, putting yeah. crooked numbers off of him, Jose Batista, about seven years ago. and then Same day, too. Mm. What the same? I like, saw August? same date, same date. Wow! Oh, his first start in Sky Dome, awful. His last appearance here were I saw this tweeted out the same day. That's pretty amazing. Wow! Maybe Absolutely. he should just retire at that. Just just let it be. It's it's kind of brilliant. With ten simple, million dollars, I'd be like, see you guys later. Bye. Well, he can make more. He he will undoubtedly make seven yeah. figures on his I'm next going to job. A beach. <laughs> I'm going to beach right now. So there's your twin statements here on Mac.